Hi, it's Rich Neapolitan. In this talk, I'm going to be talking about doing inference invasion networks. I'm showing, in fact, exactly how useful they are. What is inference invasion network? It consists of determining the conditional probabilities of all the remaining variables in the network, given that we know the values of some of the variables. Here is a Bayesian network that has to do with detecting credit card fraud. It's from an actual system created by David Heckerman of Microsoft. It's the kind of thing that goes on when you go to use your credit card, uh, for example, at a gas station on the road, and you suddenly find it's denied. And the reason it's denied is because a program like this was run based upon knowledge about you and your variables and it looks like it's likely you may have it may be using fraudulently that somebody stole or found your credit card and is using it and this is only a subset of the variables but this is this is the fraud variable the probability fraud equals yes is very small 0. 0.00001 and these are variables that are properties of the individual who owns the credit card this is the probability of being in various age groups, is probably of being male or female. And these are variables that depend upon the other variables. This is the probability of purchasing gas, and it means purchasing gas some distance from your home location. If it is being used fraudulently, the probability of, the per of gas being purchased some distance from your home location is 20%. But if, if you are the one using it, the probability is very small. In other words, people who are using a fraudulent credit card often buy gas some distance away. People make big jewelry purchases, big item purchases like jewelry, if they are fraud. Now, why are these other variables related to jewelry? Because people of different ages and sexes are more or less likely to buy jewelry. Uh, an, an older woman is more likely to buy jewelry than a, than a younger man. So let's look at some of these variables. If you are, a, if, if, um, if it's not being used fraudulently and you're young and you're a female, the probability is 0. 0.0005. If you are, um, Let's see, let's look at where your sex is male and you're young, it's 0. 0.0001. The probability of buying jewelry is smaller. Let's look at one of the bigger probabilities. The probability if you're in this middle age group and you're a female, the probability of buying jewelry is 0. 0.002. That's pretty large relative to the other values. This value up here means that the credit card is being used fraudulently. F equals yes. And these variables mean they can have any values. It doesn't matter what the age or the sex is if the card is being used fraudulently because, you know, somebody else has your credit card. That's with your age or your sex. And the probability of jewelry purchase if age is being used fraudulently is 0 0.05. It's substantially higher than any of these. So buying jewelry is indicative of fraud. Now, what is inference? It means we find out that jewelry is purchased. How does that change the probability of fraud? We find out that gas is purchased at some distance from where you live. How does that change the probability? There are many related variables like this, and the goal is to find out their values and decide how the likelihood of fraud changes. Let's look at a simple application of inference. It's actually any application of Bayes' theorem is really inference in a two-node Bayesian network. Let's look at the HIV example again. Remember, these are the same numbers we saw before. The probability HIV equals present is 0. 0.00001. And then we, point, we have an arrow from HIV to ELISA because the test result is causally dependent upon whether you have HIV. And these are the conditional distributions. This is the true positive and false positive rates that we looked at before. The probability of ELISA being positive, given HIV present, is 0 0.999. But ELISA equals positive, given HIV equal absent, equal 0 0.002. If we know the value of ELISA, we can compute the probability HIV equals present, given that value of ELISA. That is 
Bayes' theorem and Pythagoras also inference in a two-node Bayesian network. Remember, we had this formula before, probably present equals positive, by positive equals present times probably a present, divided by probably positive given present times probably a present, plus the prob probability of positive given that absent times probably of absent. It turned out to be 0 0.005. I won't belabor this example before. It's just to show you that this really is a Bayesian network and it uses Bayes' theorem to do inference. Now, to do complex inference in a large-scale Bayesian network, we need not only Bayes' theorem, but we need to exploit the conditional independencies. The reason you can do inference among many nodes in a Bayesian network is with sophisticated inference algorithms, some of which I described in the text, that use Bayes' theorem in conjunction with exploiting the conditional independencies. I'm not going to discuss them in these talks, how the inference algorithms work. You can read them if you are interested. I want to discuss the meaning of, and of, of, of the inference and, and, and show some examples of it. So what I'm going to do now is just make the assumption that we are able to do inference in the Bayesian network using inference algorithms, again, that, and they, they've been developed over the last 20, 30 years. And I'm going to use the Bayesian network inference a package called Netica. And in fact, do a Google search for Netica, N-E-T-I-C-A, and you can download this package for free. It'll handle up to some maximum number of nodes, which is 13, which is all you will need for this course. So I would like you to download it, and I'm going to make available these networks I'm going to look at, and you can actually play with them in your leisure. All right, I'm going to leave PowerPoint now and, and look at some networks in Netica. All right, this network is our lung cancer example drawn or created in, this pack word, in the package Netica. This is the prior probability of smoking history. It's 0.2, not smoking. This means not smoking, H2. So the pro this is bronchitis given smoking. Again, Netica does not show the conditional distributions. It shows the the prior probabilities which are computed from the conditional ones. All right, that, that is more meaningful because as you do inference, these values have, have, have more meaning than the conditional distributions which are actually used to specify the network. So the prior probability of, of having bronchitis is, is 0 0.09, these are out of 100. Actually, I haven't looked at this in a while. That seems kind of high. 9% of the people have bronchitis. Anyway, according to this network, they do. Part probability of lung cancer is much smaller, 0.1. It's the prior probability of being fatigued is 5 point, it's 0 0.05 again. And it's the prior probability of having a positive chest x-ray, that's 0 0.02. Again, that seems a little bit large to me. But anyway, the, the, if whether these numbers are accurate or not, it's not important. The, what's important is, is showing what's going on here. All right, so these are the causal relationships. Now, let's say a patient comes in and the patient complains of being fatigued. All right, so we instantiate this. We now know the patient is fatigued. Notice the probability of bronchitis went up to about 17%, and the probability of lung cancer went up to about 1%. Inference in a Bayesian network accomplished this. It changed the probability of these diseases. Now, now the, we, we, we know that we want to ascertain further what's wrong with this patient, so we ask the patient some questions. Do you have a smoking history? Let's say the patient says yes. Well, now the probability of bronchitis goes up to 40%, and the probability of lung cancer goes up to about 2.5%. Well, now we fear the person may have lung cancer, so we do a diagnostic test and, and do, give them a chest x-ray, and let's say it comes back positive. Well, now the pro probability of lung cancer went up to 45%. Why? Because all three of these manifestations or symptom of lung cancer. All right, let's look at this. Um, that shows basically how the inference works. All right, but let's um, remove all these findings. And, and, and let me show you a point that I made before. Remember I said that bronchitis is not independent of, of a positive chest x-ray? Notice that it's 9. 
I find out the probability that you have a positive chest x-ray, it goes up a little from 0 0.09 to 0 0.0923. Because of this link, it made lung cancer more probable, which made smoking more probable, which made bronchitis more probable. All right, so that illustrates what I told you before, is that there is this link. But because the link is it's such, it's such a long chain, it, 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 the longer these chains are, the less, the less likely it becomes based on the evidence in general. Now let's remove these findings again. Now I know the person smokes. There's a 25% chance they have bronchitis. Now finding out that they have a positive chest x-ray makes lung cancer more probable, but it doesn't make bronchitis more probable because, as I said before, that only happened because it went through this causal path and this causal path is blocked off now. All right, that's a pretty nice example of the lung cancer. Um, network. Let's look at uh, some other ones. Let's look at that fraud network. This fraud network is interesting. These are the prior probabilities of the various values. Notice something. The probability of fraud is almost zero. If I find out the person has a certain age, here it's between 30 and 50, it doesn't change. If I find out the person has a certain sex, it doesn't change. And that is reasonable, right? And that there's no causal link between these two, all right? And, and in fact, men who are less than 30 um, are no more likely to have a car being used fraudulently than women who are greater than 50. So fraud would not go up if we found out properties of the individual. Let's remove these findings, though. Let's say we find out jewelry has been purchased. The probability of fraud went up to 0 0.065 became more likely. Now this is something interesting in which people have initially have a hard time um, seeing. Now let's see what happens if I say that this person, notice this point zero six five. I make this person a male, it went up substantially to point twenty. Why? Well not because sex has any causal effect on fraud, but men are less likely to to buy jewelry, which makes it more likely that it's being used fraudulently. So once you instantiate an effect of two causes, it renders the causes probabilistically dependent. Psychologists call this discounting. If, on the other hand, I find out it's a female, it goes down because females are likely to buy jewelry, making fraud less likely. If I find out it's a female between 30 and 50, it goes down even more because that's the most likely group to buy jewelry. So that's interesting. These two are not dependent, fraud does not depend on these two unless we instantiate this common effect because it renders them dependent. And that, that's something that takes some thought and it, it's, it's a very interesting result and, and, and Bayesian networks can capture this kind of phenomenon. Let's remove all the findings again. And if I find out that jewelry is purchased, fraud went up. If gas is also purchased, it goes up even more. If then I know that this is a, a young man, it goes up to almost 10%, and now we might issue a warning. That's how these warning systems work. All right, like I say, you can, you can, I'm making these, these networks available, and you can play with them yourselves in your leisure hours, and, and, and look at some of these interesting results. Let's look at just one more network. Um, this network is actually from a paper written by um, a professor at the University of Kansas named Shinoy, and he's in the business school, and it's predicting bankruptcy. And I, the network is described in my book, Probabilistic uh, Reasoning for Financial and Marketing Informatics. It's another Bayesian network book I wrote. And I don't know, recall offhand what these variables stand for, but this stands for bankruptcy. And these are variables that are predictors for bankruptcy. This is called a naive Bayesian network. The, it's used, they're used for prediction. You put the variable you want to predict as the root and variables that are predictors as children, and you create the probability of each of these variables given the value of the root. 
And then as you find out these values, bankruptcy becomes more or less probable. I, again, you can look at the references to see what these variables stand for. Uh, but let's say this becomes zero. Bankruptcy became improbable. It becomes one, it becomes more probable. Less probable, more probable. Not much change, more probable, more probable. Not much change, wait, it didn't, it didn't take. More probable. More probable yet. Notice the, we're almost certain of bankruptcy when these variables have the, these values. 99.7. <laughs> I guess a company that has these values is not doing well. 99.8. Oops, that went down. That one. All right, so if you have these values, according to the system, we're 100% certain that you will end up being bankrupt or be bankrupt. All right, so that, that is one common application of Bayesian network is a naive Bayesian network for prediction. All right, so that will end this talk for today.